Who is Carrie? Chapter 8, Part 2 of Chapter 8. Well, it was a disappointment, but I didn't want to show it for fear Dan would think I was blaming him for it. So I got him a nice piece of veal pie and some bread and beer, and we pulled our stools up close to the fire, which was dying down, and sat there in the shadows with the cold wind outside giving a good whistle from time to time, like it was calling somebody and didn't know who. I watched Dan eat the veal pie and drink the beer, and between times toast bread on a long fork and smear it with blackberry jam, and to take my mind off my troubles, I asked Dan what Dr. Johnson had said about his notes. He said he didn't know any more than anybody else what would happen to them. It would depend on the new government, and there was no telling what they would do. I wish they'd make up their minds one way or another. I don't think I can stand this much longer. Since there ain't nothing you can do about it, Dan, I think you ought to put it straight out of your mind. I know I should, Carrie. I know I should do that, but blamed if I can, it just keeps coming back. Maybe you'd best sell them while they're worth something. I don't know, Carrie. What would you do if they wasn't worth nothing at all in the end? He looked mighty grim and shook his head. I'd run off, he said. I wouldn't have no choice. I'd run off and hope that somehow I could get Ma free, too. Well, that scared me some. If Dan run off, he might go up to some place like Massachusetts or even Canada where he'd be free. Of course, in Massachusetts, if your owner found out where you was and went to court to get you back, the law would send you back, but you wouldn't be easy to find. I didn't want to think about that, so I changed the subject. There's a rumor from the Mount Vernon folks that the president's going to let Mr. Fran Francis go. I don't see how that could be, Dan said. Mr. Francis runs the most famous tavern in New York. He's got to be the best for a steward. That's the trouble, I said. He wants everything just so and plenty of it, four or five different wines at a meal and a half dozen dishes. The president, he says it's a waste. He likes things plain and don't eat but two dishes at a meal. Well, there's a point, Dan started to say, but just then the kitchen door banged open and in come Horace, the wind and snow swirling in behind him. We was mighty surprised to see him. Horace said that when Mr. Francis was on his way back to the tavern, he seen Dan coming along to the president's mansion, and he told Horace. Dan, Horace said, Mr. Francis says Captain Ivers is planning to take the Junius Brutus down to Philadelphia. Why, yes, that's so, Dan said. I figure you could carry a letter down to Willie. I figured I'd better warn her that Captain Ivers is down there. I might not have a chance to find her, Horace, uh, but you might. Uh, I might. I'll take the letter, and if I don't find her, maybe I'll run across somebody who knows her and can deliver the letter to her. So I got Horace some of the veal pie, and Dan gave him the toasting fork, and while Horace was getting warm and comfortable, I fetched a bottle of ink and a sheet of paper out of the pantry where Mr. Francis kept them for making out his menus and things. And while he was getting his bread toasted, I said, Horace, there's a whole lot of rumors going around that the president is getting ready to let Mr. Francis go. It's true, Horace said. Mr. Francis said so himself. He said the president didn't hold with such fanciness as Mr. Francis wanted. He says the president of the United States ought to set the best table in the country, never mind what it costs. He says President Washington can dismiss him or kill him, but he's bound and determined to set the best table in America as long as he's steward. Then, when Horace had stoked up on toast and veal pie, he set himself down at the table and began to write his letter, scratching and splattering the ink and blaming the pen and the paper, and I don't know what all for the mess he was making. As he wrote, he said the words out loud, Dear Willie, I am mighty... He stopped and chewed on the end of the pen for a minute. Then he said, Say, Dan, I'll bet you don't know how to spell mighty. Sure I do, Dan said, shoving another piece of toast on the fork. Let's hear you do it, then. Of course he knows how to spell it, I said. Don't you believe him? I believe him, Horace said. I just want to hear him do it. There's more than one way to do it. There isn't but one way that I know of, Dan said. That's all you know, Dan, Horace said. I've seen it spelled a half dozen different ways.
Sure, but only one of them was right. Well, that's the question, isn't it, Horace said. Which one do you think is right? Why, it's M-I-G-H-T-Y. Horace swooped down with a pen and wrote it out. Then he tipped the page down to the fire and had a good look at it. M-I-G-H-T-Y, he said. That ain't right, Dan. That G don't belong in there. That's clear enough. I ain't sure about the H neither. Yes, they do, Dan said. That's the way it's spelled. Well, it looks mighty peculiar to me, Horace said. I couldn't tolerate the H, maybe, but... I could tolerate the H, maybe, but an H don't pronounce much anyway, and you can take it or leave it. It pronounces pretty well at the front of your own name, Horace, Dan said. Oh, sure, he said. That's because it's at the front. When H is at the front, you've got to pronounce it. Everybody knows that. But hidden down in the middle of a word, it don't hardly matter at all. It just rushes by like a tassel of air so as you don't hardly notice it. But G is different. A G is a real pronouncer. You can't skip by it the way you can skip by an H. It stands out. It's like a hook there in a word, and it catches you up as it goes by. He shook his head. No, Dan, that G don't belong there. And he scratched it out. Dan finished toasting his piece of bread and smeared it up with blackberry jam. Do as you like, Horace. It's a free country. I reckon you can spell it any way you want. But Horace had got back to the letter. Mighty worried if you was all right. Dan took a bite of toast and said in a muffled voice, Horace, how are you spelling right? Horace gave Dan a look. Why, R-I-T-E. Any fool knows that. You wouldn't put a G in there, would you? What fool would put a G in there, Horace said. Most fools I know, Dan said. It belongs in there. Horace stared down at the letter. Then he shook his head. No, he said, there's no place to fit a G in there. Dan, it won't go, and he went on writing. Captain Ivers is coming to Philadelphia. He looked at Dan. Now there's one I bet you can't spell, Dan. I bet I can too, Dan said. I've been to Philadelphia. That don't mean you can spell it. Let's hear you spell it, Horace, Dan said. That had just given away to you, Dan. Let's hear you do it. Dan... He sort of grinned and said, P-H-I-L-A. Horace slammed his pen down on the board and leaned back and looked at Dan. Dan, you beat just about everything. I never seen anybody for jamming in letters where they don't belong. You don't need no P or no H in Philadelphia. The way you throw letters around, you'd think there was no end of them. It's just a waste. He shook his head. I ain't never seen nothing like it. Well, Horace Dan said, I always admired a man who went his own way regardless, but you got an advantage on me. You're free and can spell any way you want. I ain't free and have got to do it the way I'm told. It makes all the difference.